This is Alex. He's a regular, normal guy, working a 9-to-5 job. He doesn't make an impressive six figures a year, and he could only afford a used Honda, even though he's always been dreaming about something more extravagant. And this is Henry, but it's more correct to pronounce his name as Henri, since he's French. You might have noticed from his clothes that he's, one, old-fashioned, and two, quite rich. Yep, you're looking at Henry II of France, a medieval monarch straight from the 16th century who could afford anything he wanted back then. And he's not old-fashioned. He actually looks pretty edgy for his time. Sure, Alex and Henry never met and will never meet each other. After all, they're from different time periods and their statuses are pretty different too. But what if I tell you that Alex leads a way more luxurious life than Henry II of France? This one may not sound too convincing, but any of you who's watching this video leads a more luxurious life than a medieval king. Let's dive in. Royal carriages seem romantic and all, but no matter how advanced a carriage was in medieval times, it will never be a decent rival even for the rustiest and most decaying car of today. I'm not speaking about AC, car audio systems, and other fancy features. It's more about the quality of the roads and the overall comfort. Modern suspension works wonders. And even though there's evidence many carriages back then did have suspension systems, they still can't be compared to what we have today. Next on the list is pretty obvious, medicine. Yeah, insurance today costs a pretty penny, and sometimes it's cheaper to extract a tooth than to cure it. But at least you won't be treated with the help of herbal cures. These can be good indeed, though sometimes we need something more advanced. I mean, a headache is more likely to go away with the help of a pill we have in our emergency kits at home than with the help of sweet-smelling herbs. In medieval times, cures used rose, lavender, sage, and hay to help someone with headaches. And should something more serious happen to anyone today, they'll see someone with an actual degree, not a magician. Yeah, that was pretty common in medieval times. Okay, enough about the sad things. Plus, something cool's going on right now. Alex has recently met a girl on a dating app, and it's their first date today. Henry II of France would have been terribly jealous if he had known such a thing was possible. He got married at the age of 14, and his wife was from the prosperous family of Medici. Henry couldn't simply choose any peasant girl he liked. Royalty was supposed to get married wisely, taking into account all the financial and political advantages. Seems like in terms of love, Alex from the 21st century wins. But in terms of wealth, there's no doubt it's Henry. Have you ever heard of the term usury? It's something totally normal today, but quite prohibited in the Middle Ages. Basically, usury is when someone makes money from money, aka charging interest. Usury was banned due to religious issues in many medieval places, but still, you couldn't just go get a loan from a bank. But as always, some people did find a way out, so loans technically existed. The easiest way was to issue a binding bond for, let's say, $20, while the borrower would only get $15. Voila! There's no interest mentioned on papers, but still, the borrower got the money and the loaner got their interest. So Alex would have trouble with his credit card back in medieval times, and Henry wouldn't need such a thing as a credit card. He's full of his own funds. All right, and what about other money things? Today, we can send and receive money instantly to and from anyone. Thank you, almighty internet. But in the Middle Ages, things were pretty complicated. So a young prince couldn't text his father king, so he sent him a bit of money to cover that tavern bill. The first almost fast money transfers appeared in 1851, thanks to the invention of the telegraph and Western Union. Ah, as for taverns and food in general, trust me, the paintings showing incredible feasts sometimes exaggerate. Before Photoshop and other editing programs appeared, those were the artists themselves who retouched the painting. 
I mean, everyone wants to look good, even food. Going back to meals, if you fancy spices, you know it's not a big deal to find them in the closest convenience store, and they don't cost much. But back in the medieval times, they were so expensive and hard to transport that only the noblest people could afford them. Sure, kings did have access to all of them, but you know, if they saw today's spices section in the supermarket, ah! they'd think it's sorcery. By the way, there was even a special department at the royal court called the Spicery, and it's not hard to guess that it was entirely devoted to spices. As for the main course, medieval kings would typically eat wild game, and they didn't have much of a choice. Now let's peek at a typical king's menu. First off, on the king's table, there was a stuffed chicken, a quarter of stag, and a loin of veal that was generously covered in sauce. Next, a huge meat pie adorned with smaller pies. All of that would form a crown. And for dessert, there were some jelly, cream, cheese, and strawberries stewed in rose water. That probably sounds fancy, but remember that even so, there wasn't much choice. The food highly depended on the region where the king lived. Plus, he couldn't just pick up the phone and order sushi delivery. Hey, what do you do? Anyways, no matter what we do, in most cases, modern people are often free to choose their profession. At least, we can technically do that. But a medieval king didn't have such an option. He had his royal duties. New laws? Yep, the king probably didn't have to create them himself. But he needed to approve of new ideas and implement them. Protecting the kingdom from enemies? Absolutely. And I guess that must have been tiring. I mean, even Alex is quite burnt out with his 9 to 5 job. But at least he doesn't need to plan any protection strategies. And it's not that millions of people in the kingdom depend on him. And don't forget that the king is the person who would have negotiations with foreign ambassadors, settle down new relationships, and sometimes even stop those relationships. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of responsibilities. But even if all these points didn't convince you that you're way more luxurious than a medieval king, and you still want to be one, these are some pieces of advice for you on how to be a good king. Just in case scientists finally invent a time machine. Number 1. Be dominant. A real king should know how to show strength and power. Nobody cares what personality you have. You need to show how potent you are. Or at least fake it. Number 2. Be protective. There are a bunch of people in your kingdom looking for your help. They probably want to have an audience with you. And you gotta be caring, helpful, and generous. Generosity is a trait of a real king. At some point, it will probably seem to you that you're a kind of therapist. But having audiences is a royal duty. Number 3. Be wise while choosing people around you. Royal duties are hard, and one can hardly carry them out all on their own. So you'll need people to delegate your duties to. Like, you can't control that all the taxes were collected and all the disputes are fairly resolved. But beware. Not all trustworthy agents are that trustworthy. Some of them may even want to poison you. Like King John, who was rumored to have been poisoned by a monk, even though the official records claim he passed away because of gluttony. The official version seems plausible. After all, you know a medieval king menu. So, Alex, you still want to be a king? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.